Good evening, everyone. It's um, Tuesday, December 19, 2017. This is the Hingham Board of Selectmen uh, meeting. I'm going to start with uh, approval of the minutes. I'll entertain a motion to accept the minutes of 15 November 2017 and December 12, 2017 as written. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Public comment. Hearing none, get right to discussion of near voting tabulator. Uh, I see the town clerk is with us. Yep. So, um, anything you want to add before we get to it? A couple of months ago, <laughs> Eileen approached me, maybe many months ago, um, <laughs> <Who's counting? laughs> with a request for some new voting machines in town. Um, uh, Pond Betty Foley's um, arrival back on scene. We got this procurement uh, issued, and I'll just read. Betty's memo to the board the proposals for the town of, for the town clerk's new electronic scanners for vote tabulation were due December 14 one proposal was received from LHS Associates Incorporated Eileen McCracken and Betty Foley reviewed the proposal and agreed that it met all the minimum criteria and scored well on the, comp on the comparative criteria we then opened the price proposal and the price quote of a base price of $48,600 less the trade less the trade in value of $7,000 on the old equipment for a net price of $41,600 plus the usual annual programming charges. Uh, Betty and Eileen were in agreement that this was a responsive proposal and recommend you award the bid to LHS Associates of Salem, New Hampshire. So that contract is under the threshold and would be um, for my signature, but there is a vote on the vote list for sure. the board. I've read the memo, I have no questions. Town clerk satisfied, it's all good, that's good for me. You know me, I got 50 questions. Uh, <laughs> All right. There we go. Um, so, uh, um, Eileen or, oh, sorry. All right. J just um, when, when you talk about it scored well on comparative cr criteria, I'm assuming that it's got to meet certain threshold requirements, experience of other towns. You know, right? Uh, obviously, the last thing we want is to compromise our election function. So, right. So I this work is with LHS now without they do our voting machines that we have now. They do. Okay. So it's it's it'll just be a transfer of machines. Everything else will be the same. Okay. And is it a technological upgrade for us? Yes. Voting wise? Okay. Yes. Um, and is it something? I know we've got to give notice to the Secretary of State. Does the Secretary of State have certain criteria for these kind of voting machines? Or they do, and, and they with within the RFP, <clears throat> they had to meet that criteria, and they did. Okay. And. <clears throat> um, when was the last time we updated our um, voting machines? I think it was 2007. Okay. Yeah. So it seems like. So it's they don't really last very long. Okay. Uh, they, because of the technology, it changes everything. So. Well, in our voter turnout, we put them to good good oh, use. Oh yes. Them, right. And um, <laughs> then last last question. Um, <laughs> Uh, where does this come out of the budget? Is this a capital request? It is. I, I received money um, in 2016, and um, that's 2017, I think. Yeah, so fiscal year. Yeah, yeah, fiscal year 2017. I encumbered it. Okay. So yes. So it's within that capital request. Yes. Correct. Okay. Good. It was a. It was we. I had received fifty thousand five hundred, and it was nicely below it. So. Good job. Questions from the audience. Hearing none, make a motion to adopt the new image cast precinct tabulator in place of the AccuVote OS optical scan system for voting purposes. Our town election, which includes six precincts and one sub, one sub precinct with a spare tabulator available, will be held on 28 April 2018 when the new system will start operation. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank Next. you very much. Lieutenant DiNapoli. Good evening, Lieutenant. Good evening. How can we help you this evening? Um, so I had submitted paperwork um, earlier in the year about possibly implementing a food truck inspection and permitting, uh, be a yearly inspection and permit, be a $50 fee for the permit. Uh, basically, I base this upon what Weymouth and other neighboring towns do. Weymouth does an actual food truck inspection and permit. A lot of other towns just issue an, what's called an FP6 permit, which is a temporary flammable storage permit. The problem with that is that, first off, it limits them to that one event that they would inspect the truck for, and really they're only inspecting them for the propane that they'd be using. Whereas if we had an actual truck inspection, 
we'd be able to look at the truck, look at the cooking systems, the hood system, anything else that's involved in it, and show that the whole vehicle is safe before it operated in town. I discussed this with Susan Sani from the Board of Health. She was in full support of it. It's basically just, you know, it's not that it is a problem, but it's to prevent there from being a problem, especially when you have food trucks, usually have large crowds, and if something were to go wrong, it's going to be a catastrophe. And these fees are consistent with other towns? Ounce of prevention. Got it. Council? Uh, yeah, I have some questions. Okay. Um, so do you have some sense of how many food trucks we, the Board of Health currently licenses? Like, what are we talking about? For Approximately a five to eight, but some of those ice cream trucks, that wouldn't apply to an ice cream truck. It would be something that's using a heat for cooking, whether it be propane or something along, not electric, but pro, mostly propane. Okay. And it seemed like from your description of the inspection process, you actually inspect not only the propane source, but the cook area and how the fryer later is set up and all that sort of stuff. Correct. Because one of the things that they found is that some of these trucks have the hot cooking griddle right next to a fry later with no protective wall or anything else. If you had any splash over or anything along those lines, you could have a fire in the vehicle very easily. Okay. And, do you, and I, I should have found this out beforehand, but... Um, does the Board of Health charge something in the neighborhood of $50, so this would be an additional fee? The Board of Health does their fee as an annual inspection fee, and I believe theirs is a $200 fee. $200, that they do. okay. I'm just, I'll tell you, I, I have no problem with this. Um, I look at these food trucks, though, as local businesses. I, I have friends who are residents here in Hingham that own food trucks. Um, so, you know, I also want to be mindful about the level of fees that we're charging folks to be able to, to operate in town. So now we're talking about a total of... $250 to run your food truck on an annual basis? This would be an so annual, yeah. Calendar, calendar year? January 1st, December 31st. Okay. Um, okay. Are you good? Uh, yeah, I guess I'm good. Public comment. Hearing none, I'll entertain a motion to implement an annual inspection of food trucks, temporary concessions by the fire department, effective 1 January 2018. I ask that we include the line to include a $50 inspection fee in that vote. It should have been included. As amended? As amended. Uh, second, as amended. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank, Thank you. Thanks, Lieutenant. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Good job. Okay. RSL? Outside? They're not used to our speedy pace. Moving right along. Hello. Good evening. Council. How are you? Good evening. Evening. How are you tonight? We are. Ready. Um, <laughs> You can give those to me, but if you're going to speak on the issue, you'd have to do it from the microphone. Oh, certainly. I'll give those to you. Yeah. And uh, what I've given to Mr. Mayo is the license agreement that we talked about last in September or October. I can't remember when. Uh, it's in final form, acceptable to Susan, signed by RSO Realty, the developer. There's also a notice of the agreement for recording at the registry, which is signed and notarized. Um, we're essentially done with the MBTA. They've, they're in the process of providing us easements. There's a couple of words here, a couple of words there. They're looking over one of the plans, but essentially we are done with them as well. We're hoping to see those in the next week or so. All right. Um, Real Estate Council satisfied with the uh, documents? Yeah, I just um, I just got off the phone with her, um, and sh she confirmed. Uh, you know, I think she wanted me to express her appreciation to you and also to uh, the folks at the MBTA. I know this has been a lengthy process. Thank you. She's certainly been a great help, and I mean that sincerely. She's been absolutely great at the end. Um, she's made it so much easier than it had been, frankly. Well, that, that's nice to hear. I think she does good work on behalf of the town. And, you know, you, you look at that little strip of land, and you think, how hard can this be? And the answer is... Difficult. When you're dealing with the MBTA <laughs> and the town of Hingham, yeah, pretty pretty difficult. But I think that um, to answer your question specifically, Paul, I think the couple of um, in, uh, most important items, you know, liability to the town, snow and ice removal, um, maintenance. improvements, maintenance, all those kinds of items. I think Susan, you, you know, you and Susan chased down together, and um, I think have come up with a, an agreement that um, 
again, council okay. satisfied with. And, and, and the MEGA has full knowledge of this arrangement and has approved it, so. Great. Questions from the audience? Hearing none, entertain a motion that the board approve and execute the license, maintenance, and indemnification agreement with RSL Realty, LLC, for the portion of the so-called tunnel cap between Central Street and Main Street, a notice of agreement with RSL Realty, LLC, to be recorded with the Registry of Deeds, and a notice of lease with the MBTA regarding the town's existing property lease for the tunnel cap to be recorded with the Registry of Deeds. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Like right. I should have introduced myself. You know, I'm Richard Henderson. Apologize for not doing yes. that. Yes, that's we, my oversight council. Sorry about that. Thanks for being have here. Have a nice holiday. Thanks. Okay. Hey, um, one thing um, before you go, do, do you, I know you're waiting to hear from the MBTA. Susan, um, Susan indicated it could be a matter of weeks. I mean, you know, the merchants are obviously chomping at the bit to get that to get things back online. Do you have any sense of the the timeline for this? I hope it's not weeks. The only thing I think, as, as far as the Okay. So I hope that would be okay. I was hoping. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You just worry about people's calendars getting toward the end of the year. But I guess, I guess, for the town and the public to know, um, this is a crucial step in this. We've moved forward with it, and now we're just really waiting for final sign-off from the MBTA. Is that right? Okay. Yeah, I remember. Um, okay. 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 All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we're going to continue on with the budget hearings. We have uh, tonight slated to hear from the South Shore Country Club, the Engineering Department, and the BPW Fire Department, Dispatch, Police, Public Service Utilities. So with that, we'd invite representatives of the Country Club to step forward. Uh, Mr. Mayo. So if you go over to you. page 113 in your books. Yep. As you know, the Country Club, South Shore Country Club is an enterprise fund. <clears throat> I'll walk through their budget request numbers and uh, year over year from last year to the request of this year. The South Shore Country Club golf uh, budget line, they're Sum total is one point eight nine million nine hundred thirty six thousand twenty two cents. One million eight hundred uh, for FY eighteen and FY nineteen. They are dropping that request down to one million eight hundred nineteen thousand two hundred seventy seven dollars. Um, I'll go through some reasoning here in, in a minute. The next page is the restaurant um, restaurant expenses. That line is is increasing from one hundred and five thousand to one hundred eleven thousand four hundred. Uh, that in large part is just based on utility costs, um, which we can go over in a minute. Ago. The country club pool is level funding at 15,000 from FY18 through 19. The bowling operation is projecting a, a decrease from $142,272.96 to $128,000. And the last, the last budget within this work set is uh, the simulator group and that's a level funding at fifty thousand dollars so what jay has in essence done um, for the country club is to decrease his 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 expenses projected at 3.61 percent decrease of over fy 18. Um, the budget has forecast revenues matching that of expenditures um, while reimbursing the town for all operation expenses borne by the town on behalf of the country as per yeah, the I think that's the per the enterprise yeah. fund. I think that's a big point to make here, right? That's right. So, if you have any questions, Jay is here. Um, yeah, you know, I think it gives us an opportunity to check in with you and see how the how you thought the season went this summer. I noticed some um, some green repair. I hope that wasn't due to some of my errant golf shots, but you know, no, no definitely not. We uh, we had a great year. Uh, you know, as far as FY18 goes, where we're at right now. We're significantly ahead from where we were at this point in time last year. Uh, revenue's up uh, quite a bit. It's been a good year so far. The work that you saw uh, from Fort, from uh, the, the road on yep. the side yep. of the golf course there is uh, the work that we were able to accomplish through the Hingham Scramble Championship. So we oh, raised about uh, yeah. $45,000 through that golf tournament, and we were able to invest that right into the golf course. We did a whole renovation project <coughs> on the green. 
Uh, we, we did that whole area, and all that all of those funds came from that golf tournament and our fundraising. That's fantastic. Uh, so, yeah, that significantly helps our budget when we're building our budget because some of that capital, although some of it we need to fund through the budget, some of our equipment costs, uh, some of those land improvements. After a few years of doing the tournament, we know we're going to be able to fund through through that fundraising effort. So it, it helps us take a lot of pressure off the budget for sure. And those are expenses that I would have had. I wouldn't be able to say that we're up where we're at right now right. if I had to have spent that money through the budget. So what are the uh, what's the main drivers for the for the decrease in expenses? The is, decrease is it utilities in expenses, or is uh, it no? We had we actually decreased elimination of two positions um, that we re we put into place uh, last last calendar year, so it, we get the full uh, benefit of it in this next fiscal year and in eighteen also. So uh, we eliminated one office staff position and we eliminated one pro shop uh, manager position. And we've been able to get by without them. So, you know, we're really looking at some of, you know, we've had a, couple, a tough couple of years over the last, you know, yeah. three or four years. So we've really looked at ways to decrease, you know, our fixed costs to try to make it so we can handle fluctuations in the weather and not have to be here in June, um, you know, looking for help. So, you know, between that and uh, the decrease in the bowling alley, which is attributable to the fact that we have decreased revenue. So we really have to find ways to cut our costs there or else we're not going to be able to operate in the black in the bowling alley. Um, so... Our revenue has been decreasing, so it you know, coincided with that. We've had to cut everything we possibly can um, to get down to where a point where we can continue to operate in the black. It's a challenge with the bowling alley. I, I give a shout out to the bowling alley now that the weather's turning, right? It's yeah, a, please uh, come. It's a good time. We're open right now as we speak. Um, and um, maybe for members of the public that don't know, you hosted the qualifier for the U.S. Women's Open. Yep, yeah. And course, this, it was in the, great the, shape. The coolest event I've ever been associated yeah. with in golf. Um, we had a qualifier for the Ladies U.S. Open this year in June, and uh, there were 50 women qualifying for one spot to go to the, the U.S. Open. Uh, the woman that won, this Nana Madsen, she was on the uh, Symmetra Tour, which is like their like lower level uh, LPGA tour and uh, she didn't play well in the US Open but it was a really cool event women from all over the world came to the club to play and you know 50 women vying for one spot and uh, they were you know they were between events all over the place and they came to Ingham that week yeah. it was a really cool event it was really it was fun to showcase the golf course that's fantastic and last question uh, how are the new golf carts they're great we're in the process of figuring out how to keep them uh, stored for the winter so <laughs> we're working on that now how old's the uh, bowling alley, anyhow? The bowling alley, so they, they did a renovation of the club in, like, the early 50s, somewhere around there, and they built that whole wing. It was a 20-lane yeah. bowling alley at the time. Really? And then when the town took it uh, in the 80s, they, they converted it into 10 lanes and used the other area as office space, locker rooms. Um, so the original bowling alley was built in the 50s, um, but it's been retrofitted since then. But it's all, like... It's like walking into the 1950s in there. When you go, in, I mean, the decor is one thing, but when you go into the back, I mean, it's all like chain-driven pulleys and nothing's. I mean, there might as well be pin boys back there. <laughs> so, it's, it's, so that's a big decision if there's an upgrade. Yes, yes, that would be a big. It's a, the bowling. Uh, you know, we're we're trying hard to make it work, but it's a dying sport. You know, it's um, you know a lot of the decrease we see in revenue is associated with loss of customers. Um, and it's not due to um, them going down the bowling alleys. You know, it's a it's a it's a senior sport. Uh, you know, we make a, we do well with seniors and birthday parties. Uh, not a lot of traffic walking in off the street. Not a lot of little kids. Um, you know, it's a it's a tough sport um, to to make it work. But we're doing the best we can. So uh, we try to offer a good product at a good price, and, and and you know we don't have to pay rent, don't have taxes to pay. So it's you know, if we can't make it work, it's harder for. You know, I enjoyed playing there as a kid. Yeah, it's a cool spot. Yeah. And still, I mean, we look at it like it's a, you know, a unique part of our operation. Sure. I mean, the people yeah. that are coming in there are, like I said, senior citizens, special needs, uh, you know, families. I mean, it's uh, the fact that the town's able to, like, offer it and offer operate it. It's yeah. yeah. pretty unique and pretty awesome yeah. for us as a community. So, you know, um, we're, we're still in the black. You know, we're not operating in the red. And we're just trying to make it, I mean, even if we make $10 in there, it's better than, you know, anything else. So. Until there's a significant need for capital investment there, we're just going to keep running it the way we can. You know? Fair enough. Bill's a good, our, our chairman and Bill friend, he's probably our best customer. <laughs> <laughs> he brings us leagues. Is he constantly. your best bowler? Why you said old people? <laughs> 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 brings us leagues. He's always recruiting out there in the start league, trying to get yeah. more people. So. Good, I like it. good. I like Excellent. It. He said best customer, not best bowler, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Too. I didn't say anything. I'm keeping my mouth shut. All right. Thank you so much. Yeah.
Thank you, Jay. Good job. Thanks, Jay. Thank you. Happy holidays. Thanks, you Bill. too. Thanks. Next up, engineering. Mr. Fernandez, welcome. Greetings, salutations. Okay, if you flip to page 60 in your budget books, you'll see the engineering budget is is a pretty uh, pretty vanilla one. In FY18 for the town engineering salaries, we had a $256,330 foot dollar cost anticipated to move up to 267420 for FY19. Uh, Roger is proposing a level funding um, the engineering expenses line as well as the road building line for a total increase of about eleven thousand dollars FY eighteen over nineteen for the department. And the additional request? Uh, no no additional requests. Okay. Oh, it's just a slight request in overtime. Seven thousand eight hundred and twenty one dollars in overtime. Okay. Yeah. Um, and are you recommending that to uh, hold on. Yes, you're right. <laughs> so uh, Roger recommended $7,821 in overtime. I, I forwarded onto the budget uh, a recommendation of $3,500. And the main reason for that was the anticipated overtime, as I understood it, was uh, some of that was to cover for a road painting, a road painting overtime fees that may end up being covered by, um, by Randy Sylvester's budget in the public works um, when that project gets rolled over into those operations. So um, I recommended moving 3,500 of the 7,800. Okay. Just because I don't know when that operation will officially switch over. Yep, yep, okay. You good? It's here. I'm good, uh, I'm good. Where, where does the highway money for um, the state highway money for paving, where does that show up in the budget? Chapter 90, I think yeah. you're referring to, doesn't show up in our, in our, in our uh, operational budget. It's just a uh, it's account the, for the town. Yeah, like so we've, the, we're allocated annually is X amount of dollars from the state uh, to the Chapter 90 program. It's allocated towards our road construction. Um, that can vary from year to year. Um, I, I would say it's not that dissimilar to what the school department might see from a funding standpoint. It's been fairly consistent since, the, since there's been a, a, a recent focus on infrastructure and trains and a lot of stuff. Yeah. That's, so uh, from a federal and a state level, um, we've seen a, a, a steady 720,000-ish dollars per year. Um, and that's developed by a combination of things. It's the population, road miles, and actually the employment rate within a community. So it can vary from community to community. Uh, but that's been fairly consistent over the last three or so years. But we have seen in the past, uh, depending on the appetite that our local state legislators have and, of course, the governor, um, we've seen that fluctuate go down um, as well. So a large portion of what we do uh, in terms of road construction, in addition to the bonding that took place um, a, a year ago or so, we have that annual Chapter 90 program that is a ostensibly a reimbursement program. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'd like to compliment you on the uh, road building work on Winter Street. Um, I do think the bump out probably would be better suited if it was granite. Uh, people are starting to forget that there's been a change in the roadway, but okay. I'll leave that to your observations. Duly noted. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, before we go on to the next budget, uh, Roger is here, and we have a few contracts at the um, sure. at the back of the agenda. And it seems like if you have questions, it might be best suited to answer. Them. Sure. <laughs> so at the first is the MCI contracting. <clears throat> if you'd like, I can give you an explanation for each contract. If that's helpful. This um, is the microsurface. Well, the, the, uh, it, it's, that's one of those, uh, Mr. Haley. The, the first one is the MCI contracting uh, contract is an extension of existing contract that we put out to bid that focuses on uh, uh, building maintenance or building work. Uh, what we found on, um, our experience has been that from time to time we have these small projects that come up that requires, um, you know, building trades and. What became very tedious is a small project required a separate contract, and if you've written a contract before, it's, I tell everyone sometimes writing a $10,000 contract is almost as much work as writing a half a million dollar contract. 
So what we did is we encompassed a lot of that type of work under Fawcett which is time materials. Uh, so if we need an electrician, we can hire one. Uh, we solicited the, the, we solicited all this work in accordance with Mass General Laws, and so that contract allows us to call this particular vendor, having bid um, the project or the potential work on an hourly basis for different disciplines within uh, you know within the needs that we might have. So that's what the MCI contract reflects. Um, the seal coating ink contract reflects our road work. It's, um, it's typically the last, on many of our roads, it's the last um, um, surfacing that we do. It's the wearing surface. Um, an example of that would be right outside this building. Uh, if you drive out, but this road was microsurfaced. We average uh, somewhere around uh, uh, three to $500,000 a year within this contract. It's an extension um, of an existing contract. Um, all the contracts that we're recommending extensions for are a result of us uh, researching the current unit prices and then obviously making sure that the relationship we've had with the contractors in terms of the responsiveness and everything we want to see within our vendors was successful in a prior year. And if that is the case, we offer up the uh, recommendation to extend. So Seal Coning Inc. would be another example where we, we, we had a successful year. We anticipate the same next year. The unit prices are held. Uh, from last year's uh, bid, so we don't see it in this particular contract. We're not seeing an escalation in cost, just as a, just as a result of time. Um, so we're recommending an extension there. Uh, the third contract is Aggregate Industries. Aggregate Industries provides the hot mix asphalt that we we place the paving, if you will, on an annual basis. Um, this is a new contract. Uh, we bid this out. Um, uh, again, with all these contracts, we have the option to extend up to three years. This would be the first term of that potential three-year contract. Any extensions would be would require the Board of Selectmen's approval. So it's good for one year until such time uh, we recommend to the Board of Selectmen and they approve an extension. Within that contract, we have escalation clauses. Um, so that's a f that those fixes are built in by st by statute. So when we see a com the commodities, uh, the oil prices r r go up and down. Um, um, as a, again, as a commodity, then that's reflected in the unit price. So right now, that price came in at about $68 a ton. We may see that go up. We may see it go down. If I knew, we'd be in a different business. <laughs> right? Oh, uh, we don't know that. The good news is that we, uh, we had targeted a lot of our work during a down period. So the prior bond that we issued, we really jumped on a lot of work real quick, and we we realized north of $150,000 in savings just wow. because of the timing. So the money sat there, the timing was right, we jumped on that when the prices were low, and hence the overtime request, all that work yeah, takes yeah, place yeah. at night. Yeah. Uh, all the work we do, a lot of that work takes place at night, and the guys have to get paid a differential at night. So I tell everyone when we do, when you provide our department $2 million worth of extra money and we don't have extra bodies, it just means we've got to do $2 million worth of extra work. Certainly not complaining, but that's the rationale behind the overtime. But in this particular contract, we worked with them last year. They won the bid last year, as um, I'm sorry, three years ago. We extended with them. We had a very successful year, very responsive, really, really happy with the pricing. We had, uh, we had more than one bidder on the job. We had two, uh, TL Edwards and Aggregate. Uh, again, they were uh, the low bidder, and all of this work is bid in accordance with Mass General Laws. Um, the uh, fourth contract is Mass Pavement. Uh, Mass Pavement's been working with the town for many years. Uh, they seem to win the contract every year. Um, they're not the only respondents, but uh, they, com they, they bid the work very competitively. They provide us with the machinery, excavators, bulldozers, loaders, trucks, everything to prepare a surface or undertake a, a project that requires heavy machinery and general construction labor. Um, and so, uh, again, we've worked with them for many years, very successful, very, very respons res responsive, and we think the pricing is, is uh, real good. Um, we have a redundant yeah, note twice. here. But, um, so, so in essence, it. no new relationships, even though we have new contracts. It's just, Correct. so under Mass Law, you're able to enter into an a annual contract with a two-year extension, Correct. and then you got a rebid. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, well, seal coating we had two contracts for, right? Yep. Seal coating we've got. Um, that should That's be. That's why it's in the second time. Yeah, crosswalk um, surface treatment. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Coating. Okay. I, I, thank you yep. for that correction. So, the other seal coating contract uh, they had not got this lot. They they didn't they didn't have this last year, but they wanted this year. And if it's um, it's a surface treatment that we put at the crosswalks. An example of that would be right in the square. 
a couple of years ago, we did a little cost-benefit analysis. Those, those uh, uh, crosswalks were painted completely. They were green, if you remember. I think they were right. green. Were they, they were I green. think so, yeah. Um, the problem with that was, you know, every year you had to paint it. And then in addition to that, uh, when they became wet, they became a little slick. Slippery. Yeah. Um, so we, again, we, several years ago, we did some research and they have this uh, surface treatment that is um, gr gritty, almost like sandpaper. So we don't worry about the uh, slipperiness, if you will, of the surface. Plus, we found that the surface itself lasts five, six years. So then you multiply what it takes to paint it six or seven times and you end up with this. It was almost a wash, you yeah. know, so and it's a much more attractive <coughs> and, um, utilitarian sort of application than the other stuff that kind of really wasn't meant for a crosswalk. We did it, but, you know, it's, it was a little slippery, so. Okay. And, and so the way these contracts seem to be ordered is, is either by kind of a building function, a maintenance function, or a materials contract. Is that the way it sort of breaks down? Correct. Yeah. Okay. So some of these contracts include materials and labor. Uh, we have come before you with contracts that are just strictly materials, um, you know, soils and aggregates. These, w these all would include building, I'm sorry, uh, materials and labor other than the MCI contract if it was a situation where he needed to buy lumber or something to buy that we would, there's a markup attached to the contract, a 15% markup that will allow him to, he then proves to us the cost and then we mark that up accordingly. And he gets paid direct cost plus 15%. And then if you, it, there's no, and there are no minimum amounts required to be spent under the contract? No. Um, the, um, the, there, that's a good question. They're, they're all unit based. So if we put down 100 tons, then they get paid for 100. If they put down 1,000, they get paid for 1,000. But what we do is we take a uh, prior several year average in terms of our contracts, and then we look at the current appropriations. So last year would be an example where we knew we were going to see a jump in quantities because of the bonding associated with the road construction. So those quantities went up, and the total contract value bid needs to reflect the total potential value of the contract okay. according to Mass General Laws. So we bid it out that way with the stipulation of the contract that says there are no guaranteed quantities. Okay. If something goes sideways or if we have a year where rain, and you know, we've had that where we had a year where going back a couple where you know, it seems to start raining in April and then right. it doesn't stop until sometime in June. Right. And some of this work is temperature and, and you know and, and climate weather, uh, dependent, yeah. weather sensitive. Yeah. Okay. And then if you if you get in a situation where you you need more services under the contract, the contract's a max, right? The you max out. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we have uh, uh, chapter thirty B allows us to increase the quantities up to about twenty five percent. Okay. Uh, so there's a restriction on that. Uh, we haven't. Um, you know, we haven't had that problem because we really try to make sure manage we understand. The, manage to the contract. Yeah. Okay. Doing a great job, Roger. Oh, Thanks thank for you. coming in. Thank you. And as well, I'm here, I just want to say one thing. Well, I'm, I, I wanted to just thank myself, thank the people that work with me. Uh, Carol, who you guys, yep. Carol, Harry, and um, and our new member of the team is Tom Molinari. So I'm lucky that I have a really great, great crew to work with. Yeah, you really do. You pro provide great service to the town and, um, you know, more savings than, than you can account for in this budget. So oh, thank we you. all appreciate it. And same to your staff. Thank you. I will extend Absolutely. that. Thank you. So should we vote these? I'll entertain a motion to approve the contract extension with MCI Contracting Inc. for Building Maintenance Repairs General Labor Bid Number BLD MAIN 15. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Entertain a motion to approve the contract extension with Seal Coating Inc. for microsurfacing and random crack sealing by fiber reinforced method bid number uh, M I C R O one six. Second. Those in favor? Aye. Aye. Entertain a motion to approve the contract with Aggregate Industries for hot mix asphalt production and pavement installation structure adjustment controlled cold milling, uh, coal planing. Bid number uh, P A V one five. Second. Those in favor? Aye. Aye. Entertain a motion to approve the contract with Mass Pavement for equipment rental and labor. Bid <coughs> number E Q U I P one five. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Entertain a motion to approve the contract with Seal Coating Inc. for crosswalk surface treatment, bid number CWST15. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks right. Thank you, Roger. Great job. Have a good holiday, Roger. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Fire Department, on mass. Here they are. <laughs> Gentlemen, welcome. Right. Okay. Just by way of introduction, we all know Chief Bob Olson, uh, Deputy Chief Lula Chance, and Deputy Chief Steve Murphy, soon to be our, you know, soon to be Chief in February upon Chief Olson's retirement. 
Good evening, gentlemen. <coughs> okay, we flip to page 44. Let's see the fire department's budget. So, the fire department has um, recommended a salary increase this year of about ten thousand dollars from five million seventy nine thousand three hundred ninety two dollars to five million eighty nine thousand seven hundred seventeen dollars their expenses uh, is an anticipated increase from uh, just under uh, just about eight thousand dollars from three hundred ninety nine thousand eight hundred and ten dollars to four hundred seven thousand seven hundred ninety five dollars they have requested uh, a couple of additional expenses that I'll let them explain, but I recommended uh, all the same, a payroll increase of $94,540 and $11,070 for a total of an additional increase request and recommendation of $105,610. So you're supporting that? I am supporting that. And. Uh, Deputy Chief Murphy and Deputy <coughs> Chief Lachance and Chief Olson are here to answer any questions. So the, the additional request, the personnel piece of the additional request, you know, I know there's been the balance between staffing and overtime. Is, is that is that driving some of this number? It is. So um, this is something, the 60,000, um, what we're doing is we're actually requesting one additional personnel for one of our groups. So we have four operating groups, um, three of which currently have 13 people assigned as the maximum. The fourth group has uh, 12 people because a number of years ago, the mix between overtime versus uh, salary come out, came out to 12.75. So that was the way that we came up with that, with three at 13, one at the 12. Um, unfortunately, this only allows us one person to be out on that particular group before we have to hire overtime. Um, the other groups, we can have two people out, meaning that two people can be out on vacation, uh, injury, sick leave, or anything else without us requiring to hire um, someone back. So we have asked, um, I think this is actually the third year that we've brought this forward, yeah, um, requesting to increase that to even them out at 13 across the board. Um, and that should help us a little bit with the overtime because now we have, again, additional personnel that we're um, taking into account. Although, truthfully, this may take a little bit to see that effect um, because again, you know, our hiring can take us anywhere from usually about 10 months um, to actually hire someone until we, you know, get them through the system, get them trained at the fire academy and get them up to speed on our individual operations and all that stuff. So um, it takes a while. So we hope to see a little bit of an impact with this in FY19, but it may be towards the latter portion. Okay, thank you. This is very much an attempt at, at uh, trying to control the overtime costs. Okay. Um, this is a step towards that ultimate goal. Okay. Is a minimum manning requirement, I take it? So the minimum manning is 11. And so what we're referring to now is our maximum. So that's the amount that are actually assigned to shift. Um, so again, on three of our groups, we have 13 as assigned to the maximum. On the fourth group, we only have 12. So this would bring that fourth group back up to the, or not back up to, but equal to the other three groups at 13. So the idea on that fourth shift, for instance, if someone is out on vacation and someone else calls in sick, now they have to hire someone back on overtime to fill that minimum manning requirement on that fourth shift. I take it the seniority governs the vacation picks? It does, yeah. And we also have other rules that regulate how many can be on vacation at a time depending upon for example only one officer can be on vacation at a time um, only two paramedics can be on vacation at a time a maximum per group we have a lot of rules that you know kind of complicated to be honest with you <laughs> same with comp time yes we actually to be honest don't really use comp time that much i know some of the other departments do uh, but comp time is only earned for our guys if they're held over in lieu of pay. And um, most of the time, the guys actually elect for the pay. Um, so we don't have that many people that have comp time on the books, and they usually don't choose to earn it. But yes, there are rules that govern comp time as well. Okay. And the additional um, expenses um, for the personnel side, there's $31,000. Um, what that is, is if you remember going back the last few years, we've been trying to get out of the fire alarm business. 
Um, we, for the most part, are officially out of it, meaning that there are no monitored fire alarm systems within town, but all of the pole boxes that are on the telephone poles and you see around in different buildings, and especially the ones that are built into the buildings, like some of the schools, that equipment still exists and it still is operational. And um, we actually, by law, have to go around and physically remove every wire, every hanger on the telephone poles and all that stuff so that the other people, the, um, whether it's Hingham Light or Verizon or anyone else, can do work on that pole. Um, so we have to remove all of this stuff and it takes time to do that. Um, we have two fire alarm, um, an assistant fire alarm superintendent and the fire alarm superintendent that work for us. Um, they're firefighters and they have this as an extra duty and so we're restricted to having them do it on overtime and it takes time. We've been trying the last two fiscal years to get them to try to get as much of the work that they can do um, but we're kind of minimum or we're, we're kind of we're not making enough progress on it so we're requesting a one-time um, overtime increase in 31,000 this will um, we've met with them they believe that this is going to be enough money to basically finally finalize this whole project wrap that out then that expense would come off and a few other um, expense items that we have still listed under the expense side would be able to come off after next year so okay but it's just a work in progress because we can't really just go and shut the system down and still have the boxes out there and have people think that they still actually work sure. and all that sure. stuff so is the new fire alarm this cell phone it actually is in most of the cases. Um, we gave the all of the businesses in town, we told them a few years ago now that we were slowly phasing our way out and they had to choose options on going to what's called Central Station. So like an ADT type of company or anyone else is a private monitoring company. And in many cases they were using cellular, cellular signals to contact the alarm companies and stuff. So it's the Fire alarm technology worked great for a long, long time. It's actually based on telegraph te technology from the 1800s, um, but it's you know it's outlived its purpose right now. So, and the uh, the gear, the turnout yep. gear. So that that's on the expense side. So there's a couple things. So on the personnel side, the additional 2313 and the 1144, those are tied to that one additional request for the salary. Um, and then the gear side is a combination of two things. One, it's the gear for that new person. Um, and it also is um, gear that we're looking to hire or not to hire to purchase for um, two firefighters that we anticipate to hire in this fiscal year. Um, so um, we've had a capital gear replacement program through uh, capital for a number of years. Um, 2013 the NFPA changed our regulations that govern our gear in a sense and now they put 10-year lifespans on it so we have changed um, last year was the first year that we actually increased the capital um, and increased how many sets we're purchasing per year um, with the goal of getting all of our firefighters to have two sets of gear that are five years apart um, and then you know every five years they get a new set and they have a new set that's under five and then they'll get their second set that's between five to ten but there's still two, two valid sets that are under the ten year lifespan and um, we've been able to do this with the capital but when we hire new guys it kind of takes a little bit out of that so um, what we had proposed this year was when we anticipate hiring new people to fund the new gear out of the operating expenses again as a one-time cost um, if we're not hiring anyone next year then that would be um, removed from the budget so and the expense is likely to be kind of toward the tail end of FY19 yes. is that what I'm hearing you're absolutely saying would okay. be. but within but within FY19 yeah. okay the other thing I'd like to just to point out about the uniform allowance is, uh, you know, it sounds like maybe two sets of gears, two sets of gear within the fire department sounds excessive, but they had an, a, a, an incident this year where, you know, half the department lost all their turnout gear because it was soaked in oil from a, an oil spill in a, ba in a basement during an, during an event. Um, and that stuff can't be cleaned out. So it takes time recoup, to replace right? that. You recoup that loss, right? The Coughlin, um, John Coughlin is still working on it. It's an ongoing uh, litigation that they're dealing with. So. <laughs> Insurance companies. Yeah. But, it, yeah. but the point is that, thank gosh, we had the, you know, we had that backup second gear available. Gear. Yeah. So yeah. And the guys can still we continue. We do have a few members that don't have a second set. Yeah, so, so we're, trying, we're, we're still trying to get to that point. With the capital, we're trying to do that because it's hard when we hire the new, mem new members. 
to go out and buy them two sets of gear right off the right, bat right, is right. a little bit of a hit. So, right. um, and it is, unfortunately, it's not something that you can go to the store and buy this. It's all custom made to each individual and it takes us uh, between two to three months to get a replacement set of gear. So um, we were fortunate the last time that you know we were able to make it work with some of our extra stuff that some of the other guys had and loaned it to the people that didn't have a second set. But um, it again, we recognized when they changed the process and um, up until 2013, there wasn't an expiration date on it. So we had our own expiration date. And I think we were using 12 years at the time. Um, but since then we said, no, that's no longer acceptable. So. Um, and how about ambulance volume? Ambulance volume um, has increased a little bit in um, the past year. Um, I think our numbers, I haven't actually run them yet for this calendar year, but we met with um, Comstar, our billing company, and um, I think we were around 1,500, uh, 14 to 1,500. So it had increased a little bit. Um, so kind of in line with what we've been expecting. And so. two ALS ambul ambulance, ambulances? Yes. Or, okay. Yeah. Yep. And the call volume overall has gone up every year steadily. Yep. Okay. Last year was our busiest. We're going to surpass that this year. Okay. Mm -hmm. And um, the collective bargaining agreement that's still outstanding, that would be in Article 4, that, yeah, that money? Yes. Yes. Because this contract is still pending. negotiating. Pending. Yep. Okay. We're hoping to be able to get it done by now, but it hasn't happened yet. <laughs> You've worked hard. <laughs> yeah. I appreciate, it's appreciate the effort. It's, 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 still, still, it's still possible. But okay. It's, yeah. But right now, now it's... I can't say it. Yep. Yep. Okay. Uh, Chief, I know this is your last budget, and uh, <laughs> you know, in the time and you're that smiling. What's going on with that? <laughs> I've sat in this chair. I've really enjoyed you know having you come up and explain everything clearly uh, and understandably to me. Um, you know, and it's it's clear that you've pass the torch on nicely to your, uh, your department. Uh, so I just want to thank you and acknowledge that and thank you for your service to the town of Hing. Here, here. Thank you very much. Great job. Have a good holiday, gentlemen. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Thank you very much. Okay, I will present the Shrek budget. Okay. Jump to page 50. <clears throat> Last year's budget was recommended for, this is for Shrek, the South Shore Regional Emergency Call Center. Um, last year's budget was $817,586. That was Hingham's portion of the um, apportionment of the assessment. And next year, the anticipated cost is $858,466. Quite frankly, that's a simple 5% increase over last year. Um, the Shrek process is has not begun their uh, the the budget review yet. That will begin at our next board meeting uh, in mid January. So, I do you anticipate that, that number will remain what it is? Or? Uh, it, it, it'll be very close to what it is. What I'm proposing here, um, I hope to know final numbers prior to your need to vote it. Um, in an effort to put something into the budget book, uh, this is what we projected. Well, um, well why? I, I mean, I realize it's a cooperative effort with other towns, but it, it just strikes me that their budget process. Why, why doesn't it? So line I, up I don't any disagree. I'm uh, I've been on this executive board for three months. For, oh. <laughs> <laughs> right. Brought a few things to their attention uh, today. I uh, intend to bring this up next year okay. uh, or going into the next budget cycle. I couldn't change the budget cycle at, at this point. Um, and I don't know that I'll be able to change it for next year, but I'm going to have that conversation. I, I prefer to have it mirror our, um, our budget cycle. Um, of course, there are three other towns that may disagree. Right, right. I, I don't know what their yeah. cycle is, but. Yeah. Um, I know that there are some grants, um, some grant cycles that they try to understand better prior to. Uh, prior to setting their budget needs. Okay. So, uh, and a lot of times the state isn't announcing grant uh, grant awards until January. So, okay. that, that's I'm sure a part of it. But um, so we're paying more than 25 percent. Yeah, I don't know what the apportionments are off the top of my head, Paul. I want to say mm -hmm. we're around 45 percent, I believe. Yeah. I take it the disproportionate amount of calls to the town of Hing. Yeah, I believe it's probably, uh, and, and again, I, I, forgive me, I don't, I don't know the exact know particulars of it, but I believe it's population-based, right? Be interested to know what that is. Yeah. Call volume by town. Yes. 
I can get that for you. I'm sure Maureen has that. Do it. Police. Thanks. Yes. Police Department. Chief Olson and Deputy Chief Jones. Welcome, Chief. Welcome, Deputy. Good evening. How are you doing? Good to you. Turn to page 37. Good to see the department here. So the chief and deputy will be presenting three budgets tonight. Uh, we'll speak first to the police department budget. Their salary line item is uh, anticipating an increase from $5,320,978 to $5,636,748. <clears throat> the one thing I would uh, let you know is that we, did, we finalized these contracts um, quite some time ago, and as a result, the full effect of that contract is built into this uh, into this budget and not okay. in Article 4. Okay. The police department expenses uh, anticipated from, uh, or excuse me, from FY18 was $347,300. That's moving up to $358,500 uh, anticipated for FY19. New vehicles this year, Chief? Um, yes, we'll be getting new vehicles uh, in fiscal 2019. <clears throat> um, we've sort of um, been able to, over the course of a period uh, of time, uh, by managing the fleet, to increase our no-buy years. So we had a uh, no-buy year in 2006, a no-buy year in 2018. So for fiscal 2019, we'll be purchasing seven black units, black and white police units. And then we'll have another no buy, we're projecting in 2022. So um, by building the fleet up and managing it and rotating vehicles, we're actually uh, been able to repurpose other vehicles and also, you know, basically save some money by not having those buy years. And those are the SUV style? Um, yes, they're, they're, they're sort of what people sort of refer to as explorers, but they're a slightly different model. Okay. Yeah. And any motorcycles in that? Um, last year we did get, uh, when this, well, this fiscal year, um, we were able to uh, purchase two new motorcycles and the um, and a pickup truck, which we have never really had for us. Yep. Was, uh, that was a result of having the no buy or the other cruises. We sort of traded off. Okay. So the chief has an additional request of $110,775. Um, I did speak with him about this, and I am not recommending that additional request. And um, I'm going to let the chief speak to that a little bit. We, we talked about this this afternoon again. I, I think our, um, our two additional requests were for a, uh, an additional officer and additional over uh, $40,000 in additional overtime costs. I think the idea is that we realize, and uh, having attended many zoning and uh, board meetings with all the construction and the 40B, we're looking at, you know, a serious increase in population of probably 500 units and the people that are going to go along with that. So we expect that we're going to need extra personnel coming forward. Um, I'm realizing that if I don't sort of propose this now, uh, what I'm trying to do is educate you to the problem that in the next couple of years we're going to have to start probably looking at putting in an additional person or two to cover some of this increased volume and build up throughout the town. So my lack of recommendation on this, on this is not a disagreement with the potential need. I just um, we discussed it, and this year seemed to not be the year to need for the, for the need. It's a it's a future problem, um, possibly FY20. And we're at 53 for Manning, 51. 53 with yeah, the patrolmen and, the and tend to think there's 51 people that work <laughs> and, 50, and two others that don't. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I used to be on the Just other side. I used to be on the other side, too, so I agree. <laughs> yeah. uh, and the overtime, the overtime, Tom, you're not recommending either. So we, we've got $460,000 of overtime right. anyway. And so that that overtime request yeah th th again that was anticipated in as a component to the increase to the load. increased manning yeah. okay Chief, where are you thing? this year on your overtime budget excuse me on the overtime budget for this year 
How is the, I, I realize we're not even halfway through the year, but you know, yeah. trends compared to previous years? It's, it's been tougher this year. Um, we're, we're probably already expended two thirds of our overtime. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and this is one of the things that I think we've talked about for a long time is that we've been holding the, the past four or five years, the overtime line item at a certain amount of, but what happens is that as we get involved in public safety issues, training, all these things continue to impact our department. And the more training we have to do, um, and I've also had this discussion, such for instance, when we have an event like the 4th of July parade, uh, it's necessary for us now to have more people than we've ever had there before. Um, not only are we tapping into our department, but we're also asking other departments to strategically place vehicles and operators and with their equipment uh, to prevent you know, stray vehicles from coming into the parade route. So as we start doing some of this emergency planning and, and working with the schools, um, you know, this, this is additional overtime, doing training at the, at, for uh, safety in the town buildings and stuff. These roles are falling upon us, and, and I, I agree they should be, but usually we end up bearing them with overtime costs um, as best we can, and people volunteering or getting comp time. But um, we continue to see those rise, and we can, can continue to see the role of police officers expanding out into, I mean, someone had told me that we'd be knocking on doors after an overdose, um, you know, looking to get people into treatment and providing these kind of things. These are the things that we're doing now that um, we've never been asked to do in the past. So with that comes, you know, the idea of spending more time and myself being a parent, having kids that are in their thirties and we're having families, we have business, you know, I think one of the things we've always wanted the life to be better for our children. Um, as a result that we're seeing officers, um, that want to, they'll work their 40 hours, um, because of the rising costs of living, they'll have a spouse that's working a full-time job as well. Um, you know, the days of getting a 60, 70 hour a week out of employees is no longer feasible like it used to be. So I think that's also driving the reason why we need more personnel because we're stressing out the people that we have on now. And everywhere I go, I, I talk to not only in private industry, but uh, other chiefs and, uh, you know, we, we're hearing the same issues over and over again about, um, you know, the, the changing workforce environment. And I'm not saying it's a bad thing. Um, it's, we didn't have FMLA 20 years ago. We had a baby in the family. You, you work two days and your wife threw you back out to work. Um, now we have people taking, and we also have female officers that are now having children. So there's a lot more different environment and, and in a good environment for your healthy workers. Um, but it does sort of cut into our overtime and to our staffing needs. So it's a juggle um, working all those things out, and that's part of the reason we'd be looking for more overtime. I would, I would just note as we're looking at the budget that, you know, this is a place where we also might want to look at the FY16 and 17 actuals. And, you know, to the extent that, that um, 19 is flat over 18, and, you know, depending on how 18 shakes out, you know, that this might be a circumstance where, um, you know, we just need to be realistic with what that overtime number is. Um, so I, you know, ask us to keep that in mind as, as we move through the budget process. Okay. Chief, what was the um, increase in, in professional services, which is the second to last line from the bottom on the pages that we have? Um, there's a $5,000 expense in there for next year. Um, a couple different projections on that. Uh, we found out during the budgeting process, um, sometimes we actually have to um, hire stuff out to be done that doesn't fall within any of our guidelines. If we, um, you know, sometimes when you're preparing a case, there's nothing better than to have a transcript present uh, for when you go to prosecute it. You have that typed out transcript that people can reference and draw off of that. That's, we didn't have that in our budget before, so we're, we're trying to incorporate uh, different mm -hmm. items like that. Sometimes if we have to do computer forensics, it's not always, we don't have an agency to do it. But one of the other we're looking at is promotional testing. Um, we're, we're sort of trying to move away from um, the, the 
standard civil service test was with, with his, was uh, 120 questions, 70 percent, 70 percent passing score, and that's it. We're looking to do something a little bit more progressive um, through the civil service system, which is um, a a system where we provide the information. Um, What's the name of it now? Assessment, assess assessment, assessment centers. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's all controlled through civil service, so you're still using civil service criteria, but it allows us to actually cater the testing towards our department, our rules and regulations, and it also allows the officers to come in and do actual exercises where they can be rated and graded on. And um, this is the growing tendency out in there. If you go and look at civil service, you'll see all the towns that are doing this now. Um, you think one of the most important things we can do is promote qualified individuals sure. um, to our supervision and part of that would be uh, the reason for this costing would be some of that test because we're we've uh, basically committed to doing a sergeant's test and a, every, a sergeant's test one year and a lieutenant's test the other year so we're sort of locked into that traditionally over the years so we always have active lists. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate you taking some time earlier today to run through the budget with me, and I also really, really appreciate um, the time uh, that you put into developing the kind of summary of the changes in the budget. Really helpful to be able Thank to you. review. Appreciate it. It helps me, too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the next section of uh, the Chief's budget is on page 54. Sorry, right. he's just... Oh, were you done? Let the steamroller go. Go ahead. You, no, go you ahead. were flying earlier. Yeah, I was going to say, just, <laughs> that's, the, <laughs> that's the steamroller. I was just the, following yeah. suit. Yeah. <laughs> I was just going to comment that, um, you know, with, with the permitting of the shipyard, I think that the, uh, the department's mission down on the north side has taken a considerably different turn, um, you know, and, and that that shows no sign of abating with the Alliance project as well and the expansion of the shipyard. So I fully understand uh, the point that you're making and, and I, I, I'm reluctant to discuss the operational approach the department takes publicly, but um, I, I just think if it's, if it's anything close to resembling what, what I think it is, that, that needs to be, that needs a refocus. And well, and, yeah, and I was going to say it's a little bit like the like the fire department's um, uh, analysis of their hiring timeline. Like it's it takes a while, so yeah, I think we right. need to anticipate this need sooner rather than later, yeah. potentially, so that when the population is there, we actually have the manning to to deal with it. Yes, right. Definitely, yeah, and, and we can see a lot of unknowns. Like this this summer, we were sort of hit with. You know, um, I, I will never, I've always taken the philosophy that we would never hold an officer back from furthering his career in something else. And so if we have officers that want to test out and, and jump to the state police, that's certainly, uh, you know, an upgrade. So we've had two officers to the state police, one officer over to Weymouth, um, a retirement, and um, then another officer who uh, just decided it was time to change his career and take care, of, and he used his... Uh, benefits from the military service and military service to retrain himself as a uh, uh, an engineer um, at Wentworth. So, you know, these were unexpected, but you know, you can see how quickly all of a sudden you have five people down. <laughs> it right. can hit sure. you. Right. So, having that plan and working out these things is something that's crucial. Thank you. That's a refreshing approach, not shared by all chiefs. <laughs> well, we're trying. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I'm we're, we're waiting for you again. now. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to ask about Baker Shields, but I'll pass. And what was that? <laughs> no, I don't Piece know. of equipment, but I'll pass. Okay. Harbor Master is on page 54. The Harbor Master is requesting a. Do you want me to? Excuse me. Yeah. Could okay. we do yeah. the AC? Do you want to do animal oh. control? And then and then sure. Yep. Okay. Sure. So animal control is page 51. Not that I'm telling you how to do your job. No, I was just going in order. <laughs> I was just following the agenda, Chief. But if you want to go out of order, that's fine. More time. You can't cut a break on this budget. We're nothing if not flexible. All right. Animal control officer. Let's see. So page 51. So the budget for the animal control officer is, again, pretty vanilla. 
We're looking at uh, an FY19 request of $64,539, up from the $64,227 from last year. And the expense budget is up about $500 from up to $5,800 from $5,300. So uh, the main the main difference in the request the additional request was an eight or six hundred and twenty four dollar request to retrain our animal control officer. Um, oh no, as a stipend. For, as a stipend, yeah. For for having had certain certifications. Narcan certification. Yeah. yeah. Narcan certifications, and and I recommended same. So. I'd just like to take this opportunity. You know, Leslie, um, she was recognized at the Veterans Day celebration. For all the wonderful work she does but also we've been you know as we've been going through the budgets talking about all the great work to make the bear cove leashing program work and uh, clearly leslie is critical to that as well and as the person who's in the park day to day and kind of the feet on the street and dealing with a lot of the issues she's she's really on the front line of that program and we owe a lot of its success to her and um, appreciate the manner in which uh, she's worked uh, not only with all of the departments but also with the citizens and members of the Bear Cove Park Committee to to make that all work well yeah, she definitely does a good job out there as a good representative to the department and town as a whole this is uh, this is another one of those budgets that um, it's uh, you know out of hundred and eight million dollars it's seventy one thousand dollars and this is seventy one thousand dollars that works pretty hard for the taxpayers yeah. of Hingham yep yeah. Definitely. I'm good. <laughs> Can we just skip what I missed? <laughs> <laughs> okay. I haven't done that. Or the Thank you. We'll have. Thank yes you. No. Yeah. Thank you, Chief. All right, so we're on here. <laughs> I'm moving. <laughs> Page 54 is the harbor map. I need a break. Hi, Ken. Hi, Joe. Welcome. Good evening. All right, gentlemen. So the Harbor Master salaries are moving from $177,457 to $177,481. Contractual obligation uh, increases. So that's a. Yeah, yeah, it's our annual increase. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we, had a, we had a changeover that's in, in the personnel, if I remember right. We had a new, added a new person. At a lower rate yeah. increase, yes. it's kind yeah. of compensated that. That's not someone getting a thirty dollars raise, just so someone knows. Okay, the expenses moved up to, uh, from fifty three thousand seven hundred twelve dollars to fifty seven thousand ninety two dollars. For a grand total Harbor Master budget of two thirty four five seventy three, up from two thirty one one sixty nine. Any additional requests? The additional requests. So the payroll ex the payroll request was fifteen thousand seven seventeen. This was anticipated as a request, I believe, for um, additional hours for uh, for Ken's um, administrative assistant. Yep. And I, I just felt that in recent years, the harbor master had received a few um, a few additional requests, and you know, having these elsewhere throughout the budget, I just wanted to make sure that we were. And Ken and I have talked about this, that we're we're uh, making sure all the departmental needs are, are met across the town. Um, so you haven't recommended this I have at, not at, recommended yeah. that that okay. uh, that salary increase as far as the expense increase the recommended request uh, excuse me the the requested amount from Ken was 11,000 I'm recommending 10 this is f to cover the would be uh, cam costs or, or rent costs over at the intermodal center that the MBTA owns we're still in um, lengthy negotiations are still mired in those um, I don't know when that will when that will um, resolve, but I'm not anticipating the town needing to pay more than ten thousand dollars rent for that building. So um, that's my that's my recommendation. Okay. If we were going to put ten thousand dollars to work in the Harbor Master's budget, it wouldn't be for an office. <laughs> it would be for more right. personnel support. Yeah. So um, realize that some of that is out of our control. Right. And uh, yeah. Ken, a lot of the moorings and things are now done online. I mean, what, you know, how, do the majority of people now, you know, do, do a lot of the moorings and things like that online, or do you still have a lot of people that come into the office? So we, we do have a lot of people that still come into the office. Um, all the, most of the applications, I'd say, somewhere around 99% of the applications are submitted online. 
However, each application that comes in, we still have to check the information with the vessel registration to make sure that the size of the boat that they're saying they have is actually the right size. So we have to double check everything as well as make sure that the inspection is current and up to yeah. date. And um, most of the people, we get a lot of people who will actually pay online so that the, the payment comes through. Um, we get one check um, for those payments, but there's still a lot of people that don't want to pay the service fee, so there's a lot of checks that still come in, and we have to process those and, and then manually enter them into the system. It's, it's kind of a steep fee. The pro I know it's, you're, you're passing on your cost, but it is... It, it is. Steep, it does give you pause to. I think we probably bring it get in somewhere here. around 40, 50 percent of people still pay electronically. Yeah. Surprisingly, so it's an option. People have if they'd okay. like to, um, but they don't have to. They can still send a check, and so that's usually when we get the people coming in with the check afterwards. Make sure the application is squared away. So we we've saved a lot of time from past years where we were dealing with lots of paper, but there still is an awful lot of double checking and making sure that everything is is right, and. And that's just to make sure the application's right, but then there's the next step of making sure that the assignments are appropriate for the boat. People change boats every year, so we have to make sure that the mooring that they are on is an appropriate mooring for their vessel. And then as moorings become vacant, we have to then look towards our waiting list and then take people off the list using our policy and procedures to assign them to moorings. So there still is a lot of process that goes on there. It's not just the fact sure. that they come over the internet that they're kind of done. There's still a lot of work that goes into yeah. the assignment. And and last year, I remember when you were in for the budget, one of, one of the increases, it was, it was about a $15,000 increase, was to get more support on the water during the peak season. Correct. How, how did, how'd that go? That's worked out very well. That's worked out very well. Um, more and more people seem to be taking to boats, um, and they're not going as far as they used to. When I was a kid, we used to travel a lot further. We used to go down on the vineyard, but people seem to be staying much more local with their boats. And World's End is just a great place for everyone to go from the North Shore to the South Shore. It's probably one of the busiest um, locations in the Boston area on any given Saturday with anywhere. We can have four to 600 boats in there on any given weekend day. So um, between that, the shipyard, you know, 500 plus, boats on slips and moorings, um, water skiing, it's, it's, it's a busy harbor, and was, it's a good harbor. Yeah. It's good that it's busy. And I was going to ask you, um, so Chris Daly is our Boston Harbor Islands <coughs> advisory representative, and he had sent me some correspondence a few weeks ago that, um, you know, the state is looking at putting some moorings at some of the surrounding islands, so Pettix trying, trying to open spectacle again, you know, for some moorings. If that were to happen, would would your team be providing some support for that, or so would it, you see someone else taking care of that? At this point in time, I don't see us really having any responsibilities um, for those moorings if they are put in. It, technically, it falls outside of our jurisdiction. Um, with that said, you know, anytime there are incidents, um, if we are the only boat out in the harbor, and when I say the harbor, I'm talking broadly within. A certain geographical area, not just within the town of Hingham. Um, if it's at night, eight, if it's 8:30 at night and there's an issue over there and there's no other boats available, we will dispatch a boat over there. So it is possible. I mean, we do um, we do venture outside of our boundary lines quite frequently to help other communities. So it is it is possible, but I don't see it really giving us a, a significant increase in our operations. Thank you. A um, couple line item questions. Postage and courier seems up from um, FY17. Um, it's consistent with FY18, but it's a, it's a, there was a doubling of that line item from 17 to 18. So um, there's a couple. So postage can vary quite a bit from year to year. Um, one of the big things we send out are mooring permits that go out. Um, that's one of the big things we send. And then the other thing, it really depends every year on the number of violations that we issue. Um, some years we've collected, you know, four or five thousand dollars in violations. Other years it's been much lower, around a thousand. So the process of issuing a violation starts with issuing um, a warning, which we then mail out. Then we issue a violation, which we mail out, and then it depends how much follow-up. So the more follow-up we do that we have to then mail, causes our postage to go up. So it does fluctuate quite a bit, but. The amount of enforcement that we're doing in any given year really has a reflection on the amount of mailings that we're putting out. 
Okay. And um, the professional services line item, what's that? So professional services is the, the cost that the town, so when anyone submits an application on the online mooring program, which is our mooring management, there's a fee associated with that. So every time someone submits an application, there's a fee for that application, and the town pays the cost of that. So we had an increase um, last, I think it was last year, because the fee went up for the town of Hingham, so our um, line item went up for the professional services. So it's essentially the vendor services to operate the online function? That's correct. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. Well, the camera's working out for you. <laughs> um, I was hoping you wouldn't bring that well. um, Good. They are working out very well. We, we watched something today on them, so they, they are very helpful. Um, like I said, we don't watch them all the time because we do have work to do, but if something comes up there, they are beneficial. So Good to hear. And I would, I would just thank you. This, um, this past year, I know um, as we've negotiated the Barnes Wharf lease and um, MOUs and things, Obviously, you're an integral part of that to make sure that all of the activities um, are operating in a safe manner. And we also know that this past year, that meant that you had to launch a boat a little earlier because the spring season for the high school students starts pretty early. So appreciate, you know, appreciate your cooperation with that. No problem. You're welcome. I'm good. Great. Awesome. Thanks. Thank, Thank you, Thanks Thank you so much. for coming in. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, our last budget dun, dun, dun. is Public Service Utilities, page 58. This is a rather anticlimactic one for the, be the last budget since it's pretty much the utility worksheets. Um, the total emergency water budget is moving from $364,424 to $414,044. This does include the anticipated 14% rate hike um, or the requested 14% rate hike that Aquarian has requested of the DPU. Um, not knowing where that's going to fall, we had to budget for the full requested amount. The street lighting expenses are moving from 547698 no, I'm sorry, uh, from 183274 mm -hmm. to 183274 That's what I should have looked over. So we've seen... We've seen electric reductions yeah. across all the different budgets. Is it, is it worth taking another look at it, this? It, it is. Um, Sue has been here throughout these budget yeah. requests, and she had another engagement tonight. Um, I spoke with her about the water budget. I did not speak with her about this one. We had seen approximately about a 30% decrease right. in some of the other, the other electrical um, budgets. I'll ask her about this one. I'm sure there's a reason why it wasn't included here. Mm -hmm. she, we, we always use the same worksheets for each of the budgets when these yeah. are built. So. Um, and Tom, just on that note, I, um, I know Sue was going to prepare just a summary of the different utilities and yep. things and where those all are. When that is prepared, um, if you could also make sure that it's also shared with the advisory committee. Of course. Just, you know, my, my point from the last time is that that expense is going down and I think we all have to be mindful of applying those savings to fund new things. Right particularly personnel related. I, I sort of view the rate reduction as kind of a one-time thing. We don't, you know, when, when, when the rates go up, we don't ask everybody to absorb that into their budgets. So when the rates go down, I, I, I think it has to sort of work both ways. I agree with that. Okay. okay. This concludes our budget hearings. Um, Mary Ellen? Yes, I have a question. Mary, could, you, Mary, could you go over to the microphone, please? It's about the budgets? Yes. Okay. I just didn't hear. I, I will need copies of all those before the, you go. Of, of all what? The budgets. Sure. I write the story tonight. Um, I just wanted to know, I didn't hear um, your revenue figure for the um, Harbor Master. Sure, the Harbor Master is, um, oh, the you said the revenue, the mooring yes. permits that... That, that's called out in the budget. You know, I looked, Tom, I was looking in the budget book and I, I, I didn't see that detail in our budget books themselves, Mary Ellen. There, there's one line that we have that's license and license fees and permits, and that's a gross number, and the, the mooring permits are, are part of that. Right. So I, I'm just asking what, the, yeah. what that figure is because it, isn't that what covers their expenses and salaries and stuff? 
Well, you know, it's, um, it's, it's a good question that the mooring, I, I believe that in general the mooring permit fees more than offset the cost. Similarly in the fire department, if you look at it, we collect a, over a million dollars in ambulance revenue um, that, that, you right. know, when we talked about the but fire it, department. But it's not budget. an enterprise fund. But there's fund. no law that says No, 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 that, it's no, not it's an enterprise fund like the country club. I understand that, but um, the no. Mooring permits are supposed to be used well, the for... Well, the mooring <coughs> permit fees are used for um, things like uh, they're used dredging. for dredging of the harbor. Right. We're applying them to, towards the Warren articles to improve the wharf. We also, from time to time, use those mooring permit revenue to fund some of the capital required from the harbor master budget. So, so we've been kind of focusing tonight on the expense side of that. Right, but I wanted to know if, the, if one offset the other at all. That was yeah, just I, and I, I apologize. We don't have that, uh, the mooring permit figure uh, at hand. And I guess, I, I mean, I, I don't view it like that. You know, I view it, it's like Mary's saying, I view it sort of like the ambulance fees that the fire department brings in are beneficial to the, to the town. The per mooring permit fees that are generated by residents of the town of Hingham that, um, that hold moorings benefit the, the harbor use, the marine uses in town, and they're a separate piece of our fund balance. But it's not a, it's not a one for one in my mind. You know, we, we have to. If we had one more, if we had one mooring with one <laughs> mooring fee, we'd still have a harbor master budget at whatever it's at. We have a harbor that we need to support. You know, so only the mooring, only the people who have moorings support that though. Support the mooring fees. Support the harbor through their mooring permits. Well, I mean, uh, they support a piece of the harbor operation. But there's the, the, the town spends other money. We've spent CPC funds down at the harbor. We spend other we spend other money right, on but capital I was just improvements. Trying to, in general, see if it were um, if there were any way I could tell if the if the more if the income were covering the department. That's all. I just don't look at it that way. Yeah, we don't have. Well, that. I'm wondering if you should. Yeah. That's why I'm asking. Okay. I I I guess I don't think I should. Because that's a law. There's a law covering No, 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 no. There's a law covering the intake of mooring permit fees to use for marine <coughs> to, to use for marine uses. So it's a restricted piece of our fund balance. But it doesn't But if it were a restricted piece of your fund balance, why don't you have the figure? We do have the figure. I don't I, we didn't bring it with us to the okay. meeting. But Could we can get, get it for you if you want if you want to request that tomorrow, I'd be happy to okay. provide it for but you. But can I have that uh, the other the budget pieces of the budget book for again I don't have that I don't have a copy of that for you tonight. I'd be happy to provide it in the morning. I, no, can but I need you. to have the story in tonight. Um, well, Mary Ellen, I, I, I think it's um, you know, it's it's eight twenty five at night and this is the first request we're getting for, you know, this kind of information. I hope I hope you can understand that that we can't produce this volume of information no, no, on request at night. For tonight. Couldn't somebody copy them? I, I think we can. Um, we're going into ex executive we, sessions. We, we still have, have um, we still have some business to conduct into the evening. So, um, uh, if we had had if we had gotten Mary Ellen, if we had gotten the request earlier in the day, we would have been able to do it. Make it easier to write. I, I understand that, and we're uh, we appreciate that. At the same time, uh, we still have business to conduct this evening. So, um, thank you. Um, okay. So this concludes the budget. That concludes the budget. Yeah. Um, so I know the advisory committee is uh, working uh, on the other side of this wall on the budgets. Um, Tom, I just want to thank you, and Sharon, and Sally, and Sue, and all of the department heads for um, producing high-quality, timely budgets. Um, we will be uh, as our revenue picture becomes a little bit clearer in the month of January. The board will be making recommendations uh, and making some votes. So this is very helpful to see where we are at this point. You're welcome. We have a great team here. and Everyone works well together. Um, next on the agenda are uh, our appointments. And uh, if uh, my colleagues would allow me, I would like to uh, make a recommendation to appoint Joshua Ross as the chair of the compressor station task force. Sure. Does Mr. Ross know he's going to be extended Mr. Ross, this, this honor? <laughs> yes. In the spirit of no surprises. You drew the short no, straw. I, I, I asked Mr. Ross if I could put his name forward, but obviously no, uh, no guarantees. And um, uh, Mr. Ross has um, 
and currently holds a couple of leadership positions and therefore is familiar with the responsibilities. Um, so, uh, so moved. Okay. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Um, so we have, uh, so we still have uh, some of the votes. Common Vic. Yep. Um, so number six. On yes. Okay. So we have a list of, uh, at the end of the year, we have a lot of licenses that are uh, required for renewal and um, they are listed in our minutes. So would one of my colleagues like to make a motion? Uh, you know, I'll, I'll move to uh, renew the annual common victual license uh, as presented for the entities referred uh, to in the uh, proposed vote list, which shall be incorporated into the minutes of December 19, 2017. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, and we have the renewal of annual uh, limousine licenses. We have one of those. Move to renew the limousine license at Charles B. Livery for one year, expiring 1 January 2018. Second. All those in favor? Should that Aye. be 19? Oh. Yeah. I think it should be 19. Curiosity. Yep. Thank you. It's a Good mighty catch. short license. Yeah. Uh, Tom, just to verify before we get into selectmen and town administrator reports that all of the votes have been they have. completed. Yes. Okay. Uh, selectmen reports. I've just been working away. <clears throat> nothing to report. Okay. Nothing to report. Um, and I'm sorry. I, I was, it, I, I was looking at Tom and I said selectman, town administrator report. I, I have nothing. I was, okay. As we're still we're doing the budgets. Okay. Paul. Uh, I'd like to extend um, uh, my appreciation to the residents of the town that have decorated their homes in very tasteful and festive way for the holiday season. It's a pleasure driving down the streets to see the houses all lit up, and um, I, I think it really adds to the Christmas spirit. So, you know, I, I, I think I'm pretty certain I speak for my colleagues, but wish you all a happy a holiday, Merry Christmas, and um, the town looks great. Um, I have just uh, two things. I wanted to note that on December 6th, the um, Hingham Conservation Land Trust unveiled a new edition of a Parklands for the Public map, and um, they actually dedicated it to Kathy Reardon, a uh, longstanding volunteer, former member of this board, in recognition of her long service uh, to that trust, including having served as chair for, I think, uh, the past 10 plus years. Karen, I think you I was there, were yeah. actually there. Really was... moving. And uh, you know, just the, the visualization of all of the work of the Conservation Law Trust and frankly, the commitment of this town to open space and Kathy's leadership on that initiative, as well as a number of other volunteers, um, was really touching. It was really, really great. And she, I think she was a little bit surprised. Yeah, well, we just... <clears throat> Uh, thank Kathy. You know, the, the volunteerism, and when you see Kat, both Kathy and her husband Bill, who um, have just dedicated so much time and uh, to, to just the overall betterment of this town, it really, um, it's, uh, I know it's inspirational to all of us. I would also like to thank um, the police department, and I, I neglected to say this to the chief, but last week the country club had its annual luncheon for seniors, and members of the Hingham Police Department and graduates of the Citizen Police Academy served lunch to 300 seniors at the country club, um, and it was just a, uh, it was delightful. Um, so uh, we are going to go into executive session uh, before the board does that, um, I would like to just make a brief comment on the open meeting law complaints that were filed against this board. Uh, these complaints incorrectly state that the board failed to convene an open session prior to entering into an executive session back on November 15, 2017. I want the public to know that this is not an accurate description of what happened. The meeting held on November 15, 2017 was posted 48 hours in advance. This board first convened an open session at 8.30 here in our regular meeting room. We then took a roll call during the open session to enter into executive session in compliance with open meeting law. In fact, there were two members of the public in attendance during the open session of that meeting. Any allegations that this board failed to meet an open session prior to the executive session are simply false. 
This board will now be reviewing these complaints in the upcoming executive session and will be filing our response with the Attorney General's Office as we are required to do under the open meeting law. So I am going to recommend that the board enter into executive session for the following two reasons. One, to review and respond to an open meeting law complaint pursuant to MGL Chapter 30A, Section 21A1, open meeting law complaints dated December 13th, 2017, filed by Lawrence DeCara and Edmund Demko. The board will not return to public session for this matter. Two, under Mass General Law Chapter 30A, Section 21A3, to discuss strategy regarding potential litigation of a personnel matter, because discussion of this matter in open session may have a detrimental effect on the litigating position of the town. The board will return to public session for a decision related to this matter. Roll call vote. Aye. 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 Thank you, everyone. Uh, good evening, the Board of Selectmen continuing our meeting on December 19th at uh, 9.37 p.m. Uh, coming back into open session. The Board has uh, one final vote. I'd like to make a motion to approve a reserve fund transfer to the settlement of claims account in the amount of $86,500. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Move to adjourn. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Happy Good New night, Year, everybody. everybody. Good night, everyone. Great. Happy holidays. Thanks, Bob. Bob, Sally, thank you. Thank you very much. You.